Hello again, and if you're just joining us, this is Nature Day at the Water Pavilion here at COP26, where we're talking about nature-based solutions and how they can help tackle climate adaptation and mitigation. Uh, I have the pleasure to introduce the next session, which is design and planning of nature-based solutions to address climate change. Um, and we will start with a video. We are living in a rapidly changing world and the climate and biodiversity crisis are becoming more pronounced every day. Solutions are rarely simple and there are limits to what we as humans can accomplish by relying on technologies alone. There is a growing consensus that we need to rely more on sustainable solutions that are in synergy with nature. Communities around the world have a long tradition of sustainability coexisting with nature to secure their lives and livelihoods, and we need to harness this knowledge. Although nature-based solutions have been supporting humanity for thousands of years, framing this concept now brings a wealth of new opportunities for future endeavors. Nature-based solutions are indispensable in nature-smart recovery and climate adaptation as they improve livelihoods, building up community resilience to climate change and reducing disaster risks. What makes nature-based solutions stand apart from other approaches is that they provide win-win solutions to simultaneously achieve social, economic and environmental goals at scale. Food security, clean water, rich biodiversity and carbon sequestration can all be achieved at once by harnessing, not harming, the healing power of nature. From protecting and managing forest landscapes to restoring wetlands and coastal zones to creating green islands in cities, nature-based solutions provide numerous benefits, including clean air and water, healthy soil and accessible food, biodiversity and ecosystem integrity, improved livelihoods and social cohesion. Nature can be a powerful ally in curbing the climate crisis. By employing nature-based solutions, community resilience can be significantly improved beyond the capacity to absorb and recover from a single disaster, such as flood or drought. Nature-based solutions are both an ancient and modern approach, evoking humans to become better stewards of their lands and ensuring the long-term prosperity of communities by maintaining equilibrium with nature. Most welcome to this uh, very important session event, we think, uh, highlighting the role of water in the planning and implementation of nature-based solutions for addressing climate change. I am Torgne Holmgren, I'm Executive Director of Stockholm International Water Institute, and I have the pleasure to moderate this session. Well, what I think we see at this COP is an increased interest in nature and nature-based solutions. For example, with the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forest and Land Use that was adopted the other day and backed by an unprecedented number of countries. And I think we have now an opportunity to seize this moment. And we will share in this session key insights from local level and also global policy level on what can be done and what is going to be done. And uh, we will have after that first part, which will be an introduction by colleagues of mine and a team from Peru, a panel discussion that will round up there where we go from now to the future. But before that, I will leave the floor to my colleague, uh, Dr. Malin Lundberg Ingmarsson at uh, Stockholm International Water Institute, who are undertaking research on this very topic linked to forest and water. So over to you, Malin in Gothenburg, Sweden. Thank you so much, Torgny. I hope you can hear me. Um, hello all. I have just shared an illustration explaining the forest water cycle, which I'm working a lot with here at CIWI. Because at Stockholm International Water Institute, we are taking a holistic approach to water. 
And one part of that is to consider uh, the contributions of trees and forests and landscapes in regulating the hydrological cycle and in supporting a healthy water cycle. Um, trees and forests are critical components of the global water cycle. And the short way of explaining how is that trees pull water from the ground and release it into the atmosphere as vapor. And this process is called transpiration. And transpiration actually can drive temperatures and rainfall across continents. Climate change and global warming are altering um, forest role in regulating water flows and in influencing uh, the availability of water resources. And it is therefore of highest importance to restore and conserve and sustainably manage forest ecosystems. And these three nature-based solutions to climate, um, both to climate mitigation and to climate adaptation, um, they have many co-benefits. Um, for example, forests act as natural water filters and forested watersheds, they, they supply 75% of the world's accessible fresh water for domestic use, but also for agriculture and energy production and industries and for ecological needs. At Siwi, we work for a better awareness and inclusion of trees and forests in nature-based solutions to address climate change, both in policy and in practice. And one way of doing it, this is to do it together with uh, global forest and water experts in key institutions such as IUCN and FAO in an informal expert network that we call the Forest Water Champions. We are also engaged in projects and capacity building to advance knowledge on how restoring forest landscapes by integrating water resource management provides so many benefits, not the least for, my, uh, for both mitigating and adapting to climate change. Now, I'm really looking forward to learning more about forest and landscape restoration from the other presenters here. Thank you. Thank you, Marlin. And um, let me now continue by welcoming Dr. Lan Wang Erlandsson. And Lan, she's a postdoctoral researcher at Stockholm Resilience Center, a sister institute to CV in Sweden. And Lan, you will present the latest findings on how integrating water into forest management and landscape restoration contributes to climate change adaptation and mitigation. So over to you, Lan. Thank you so much. And I'm very grateful for Marlene's excellent overview of the water cycle, which leads directly into the topic of my talk on water's role for the protection and restoration of forests, but also the uh, rest of terrestrial ecosystems in uh, uh, mitigating climate change and adapting to climate change. Uh, let's start. Oh, yep. Let's start uh, by having a look at what is actually needed to limit global temperature rise to a uh, safe level. Uh, there are many roadmaps, many scenarios on how to reach there. Uh, one common feature of all of them is that uh, we, they, they recognize that biosphere carbon sinks are a very important part for, for limiting global temperature rise to well below two degrees or one and a half. Um, so how do the ecosystem do this? They, start, they sequester carbon by taking up carbon from the atmosphere and binding it. They store carbon, preventing them from being released from above ground or below ground. Uh, the type of ecosystems matters. Some research estimate natural forests to be up to 40% better than plantation at storing carbon, for example. This effect can also be offset by albedo, which means that the darker uh, forest uh, might uh, absorb heat much better and thereby offset in some of this carbon sequestration and carbon storage effect. So context matters. Um, Nature-based solutions are attractive not only because of um, uh, how well they mitigate climate, but also because of the multiple benefits uh, for adaptation um, let's see, and, and other services. 
So they control floods, they help stabilize shorelines, and also help mitigate both local and regional droughts and heat waves, uh, which thereby, again, um, helps the ecosystem to provide the mitigation service and other critical services, such as providing clean air, water, food, fuel, medicines, and genetic resources. Globally, um, the area of win-wins of top priorities for restoration have been identified to mostly located in subtropics and tropics where past land conversions have taken place. We will, we will concentrate on carbon sequestration and biodiversity. Wetlands and forests tend to pop up. In this analysis, more than half of the uh, priority areas are forest restoration. Uh, fourth are grassland restoration. So grassland and shrublands tend to come up when we also look uh, at the cost criteria. Uh, but in effectively all of these ecosystem restorations in all types of ecosystems are needed. If we instead look at protection, these hotspots shifts to uh, intact, uh, still intact forest biomes in boreal forest uh, and the tropical forest, as you see in the red, um, brownish areas here um, uh, because they host vast amounts of carbon and also great hosts of biodiversity. There are, however, um, worrying signs that the tropical forest carbon sink is weakening. Uh, it has peaked in Africa and also peaked in most worryingly in the Amazon. And you see how for the Amazon, this um, horizontal line dies below the zero, which is indicates the net carbon sinks. So when it dies to zero, it effectively means that Amazon stops being our friend, helping us absorbing carbon, and turns into a foe by releasing uh, carbon. And this is because of uh, deforestation. It's because of forest mortality that is connected to uh, droughts and fires. So some of this range of, of course, due to uncertainty in the model and data, but also critically depends on uh, the measure we're setting in terms of forest protection and forest restoration and uh, how we manage to limit global temperature rise to prevent fire and drought related tree mortality. Uh, just to drive home the message how restoration and um, protection of ecosystem go hand in hand in rapid decarbonization and effectively limiting the global temperature rise, we see that severe climate change uh, threatens protection and restoration efforts globally. So protection and restoration efforts literally uh, would burn up uh, due to wildfire rise, uh, increases in wildfires, and wither away with uh, increases in drought. In the right figure, you see the green areas indicate the climate that's stable and suitable for rainforest, whereas in a severe climate change, which absolutely do not want to see uh, by the end of the century, this green area effectively is gone in the Amazon uh, and, and turns into a, a, a region that can support both rainforest or savanna equally well. Um, the reason why we need to pull the strings on land, water, climate all at the same time uh, is because they are all part of one system, the Earth system. So if you see that if you turn over the tip the Amazon forest, this is connected to the ocean thermal and circulation, this linked to El Nino uh, and global change that melts the ice sheets will also affect uh, the terrestrial ecosystems. And uh, so water echo is not just water, it is also energy balance, it's transport nutrient, it is carbon nutrient, it affects the cloud formation and radiative balance. And as Marlene was uh, talking about before as well, precipitation, which we maybe tend to think of as a climatic feature, is in fact very much linked to the land surface. In fact, 40% of the precipitation that falls on land on average uh, is supplied by land areas and up to 80-90% in some areas like South America, parts of Africa, parts of Eurasia, up to 80-90% of the precipitation comes from moisture supplied by uh, terrestrial systems. So if you look at past land conversions and land use change, in blue you have the irrigation effect and in red you have reductions in precipitation caused by past land conversions. If we zoom in to South America, uh, this is showing how the deforestation in the Amazon River Basin not only led to uh, reductions in 
um, precipitation within the river basin, within that yellow boundary, but also to reductions in the downwind La Plata region, which of course affects um, rainfall for water availability for crop yield uh, and river flow. So we tend to think of river flow impact within the river basin, uh, that a deforestation might increase water yield, but it also to decrease water availability outside the river basin in downwind areas. Uh, I focus here now on synergies and how biosphere is supporting all societal and economic activities. And, uh, but how this will play out is also very much dependent on local context and uh, uh, trade-offs across uh, sustainability goals, which I think I believe the following speakers will talk more about. Um, so to summarize, we find that forestry and forest uh, mitigation measures in these systems have a very high carbon emission reduction potential. The success of these mitigation measures uh, have a subject to uncertain and potentially unfavorable changes, uh, depending on current and future environmental change. And the water cycle dynamics are, are not only local, regional, uh, but also continental, the planetary, and potentially at intergeneration time scale uh, into the far future. Um, there are synergies, many synergies, that's why we are <laughs> uh, finding nature-based solutions so attractive, but there are also many trade-offs that need to be considered to make sure uh, that we do not compromise local to regional water sustainability goals, and therefore mitigation in the forest system must adapt to the local hydrological, climatic, and uh, socio-ecological context to maximize the benefits and minimize the trade-offs among sustainability goals. Thank you, that was all for me. Thanks a lot, Lan, and for sharing your insightful findings and also setting the stage for the next part of our session here, when we will hear more about a case study using nature-based solutions as a response to climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction at the Western Balkans. So for that, I will now invite Boris Erg, director of IUCN, Eastern European Central Asia Division, who will share with us why nature-based solutions are integral to their ADAPT initiative and scaling nature-based solutions. So over to you, Boris. Thanks a lot, Dorni, and good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all the participants. It's, it's a great pleasure being here and, uh, and also welcoming uh, all the participants in, in, in this session. Um, I'll be sharing my uh, screen, as, as just said, just to shed a little bit more light on the on the global standard for nature-based solution, but also uh, give some examples on how we uh, how we actually implement nature-based solutions uh, on the ground and uh, what can be what can be done next. And that's sort of a, a, also some food for thought for the discussion that we will uh, will be having later in the session. Um, so for those who, 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 who don't know, IUCN is, uh, is certainly one of the biggest, one of the oldest global environmental organizations. It's a membership organization, which, which matters, and especially when we, uh, when we speak about nature-based solutions. Um, it, it hosts some uh, 1,400 members and more than, more than 10,000 experts who are actually creating IUCN, IUCN knowledge and, and standards. And in 2020, after almost a decade of uh, discussion, consultation, IUCN launched the Global Standard for Nature-Based Solutions uh, in July last year, which was very much needed to frame all these discussions. And we are hearing about nature-based solutions um, in each and every meeting and, and, and at different levels. So they are being really uh, taken on very, uh, very strongly. Um, a global standard that is, uh, that is available online, that's being translated into, into many languages. A, that basically sets a, a number of criteria based on which uh, we are then uh, assessing uh, 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 solutions, whether they qualify as nature-based solutions um, and, and, uh, or not. This is more a, a facilitative standard and normative standard, even so some normal norms are being also, also developed as, me, as we move along. And the standard is to address a, a, a range, a wealth of, uh, of uh, environmental and societal challenges. Um, ranging from climate change, uh, mitigation adaptation, to disaster risk reduction, food security, health issues, water, water security, and biodiversity gains. So there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of challenges that can be uh, that are addressed by by nature-based solutions, 
And what matters also, what's important, there is uh, often more than one that we can address by a single nature-based solution. So now just zooming in a little bit into one of the examples before I zoom out again and then say a couple of words of what, uh, what's, uh, what's being uh, what's being underway in IUCN and how we see the, the future of nature-based solutions. This is one specific project that we are implementing in the, in the Western Balkans as an example of nature-based solutions being applied uh, across the region, thanks to the, the Swedish Development uh, Corporation, who was, a, um, uh, who was a visionary enough, I would say, to understand uh, the value and need of, uh, of promoting nature-based solutions at scale, at regional level, uh, in, in, in the Western Balkans and, and providing examples of how nature-based solutions work. Uh, these pictures just uh, uh, strengthen the case for, for going for nature-based solutions in the Western Balkans. You can just see an, uh, just a uh, um, few examples of, of, of recent uh, disasters uh, in the region from floods to, uh, to wildfires, including those uh, in, in in 2021, just a few months back, uh, we've been uh, witnessing uh, wildfires uh, ravaging across, say, uh, Turkey, Greece, and, and other parts of the other parts of the region, North Macedonia, for example. So there are quite a quite a quite a few reasons for for going for nature-based solutions in the Western Balkans. Yeah, um, and Western Balkans is not a uh, is not an isolated case. Yeah. So the way how we structured the process is that that we we centered it on three pillars. So one is a knowledge and uh, and capacity. Then there is a policy integration and implementation on the ground. So just we really wanted to cover the, the full cycle from generating knowledge, building capacity, mainstreaming into policies, and then implementing implementing nature based solutions on the ground. Yeah. So one particular case that we are advancing with at the moment is in Serbia, where we selected one particular uh, site a uh, municipality for for applying nature-based solutions. And that's, that area is, is very prone and we've seen over the past five, uh, five to eight years that was, uh, uh, that was, it was prone to floods. Um, and it, it's been already identified as one of the, one of the, one of the areas to, um, to go for nature-based solutions uh, in a more substantial way. You can see some of the pictures and the, the logic that we are actually, the rational that's behind is that, uh, that we are addressing uh, uh, climate disasters by trying to to restoring some some degraded land as you can see on the on the right hand side yeah? um, so this is all connected so looking at the wider landscape uh, uh, floods that happen downstream are very much uh, a, a result of a of, of erosion and degraded land upstream so that's what we would uh, what we are looking into and trying to trying to understand better linkages uh, in order to be able to to apply proper nature-based solutions uh, on the ground, um, and of course we are we are doing that based on some known principles that it has to be landscape scale, that it has to be informed, that it has to be a, 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 by engaging communities and a transparent process, and we are doing that based on on the Rome rest, restoration opportunities assessment methodology, well-known methodology applied in 40 plus countries in the world developed by ICN and the World Resource, uh, uh, Resource Institute um, and, and the partners. So this is pretty much evidence-driven, consultative and transparent process that we are doing uh, in Serbia. So the cycle of the very nature-based solution that we are applying on the ground is that we've started with a baseline assessment that it's, it's a, it is a, it is a multi-sector multi um, uh, uh, approach where we where we are looking into 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 disaster risk and reduction uh, through understanding environmental, social, and, uh, and 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 economic uh, dimensions of it, uh, and that's where we are. So that will inform the very project design, and we are already having an idea how that project or how these nature-based solutions should look like, and then we will move into into field work. So altogether, it's it's about two years. And it's been done, done through two different phases. Part of it, an integral part of it, is monitoring and evaluation. So we will be, de we'll be developing a monitoring and evaluation framework just to see what are the impacts and what are, what are the benefits of, of our nature-based base solution. And you can see here, so we hope that from this picture on the left-hand side, which is a, an erosion uh, upstream, that's true a true mapping and, and research and, and applying science and incredible knowledge, 
that we can then uh, um, reach this uh, the green, uh, uh, a restored land that 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 will have a number of co-benefits, and not just on 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 increasing uh, on increasing biodiversity and, uh, and 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 the functioning of ecosystems, but also providing uh, providing uh, opportunities for communities for local development as 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 it's also to open the door for some private uh, entrepreneurship at the local level. And you can see here how we are scaling up from, uh, from doing assessments, preparing reports, including policy analysis and mainstreaming, a capacity development program that's part of it to implementation on the ground and scaling up further by developing follow-up actions. So now zooming, zooming, uh, zooming out again, drawing to a close. So what's going on uh, at, uh, at, at global level and something that we are translating at, uh, at regional and local level as well. We are seeing the emergence of a number of a, a, a blended or, or multi-partner public-private partnerships and funds that are to support the implementation of nature-based solutions at scale, such as the Subnational Climate Fund, uh, Finance, for example. It's a, it's a new approach to, uh, to supporting local, national, local uh, businesses by investing into nature-based solutions or the ABA fund that is, uh, that is active, that is already granting activities on the ground and so on and so on. So there's a number of uh, emerging issues as we speak in terms of scaling nature-based solutions up. One of the things that's happening uh, in IUCN is that we are, we are pro progressing with, uh, with certi certification. We'd really like to make sure that there is a, is a clarity and coherence and consistency on how we, how we treat and how we understand and how we apply nature-based solutions. So that's something that's, uh, that's underway. IUCN is working with, uh, we've recognized a, a certification bodies and, uh, and organizations in order to roll out a certification process for, uh, for nature-based solutions. And just one example of a global initiative that has also its, uh, its regional chapters is the Bone Challenge, which has already managed to, to bring a hundreds of millions of hectares uh, in, into restoration globally. And we have a number of regional initiatives in Africa, Latin America, Europe, and Central Asia as well, where we are actually bringing countries and initiatives uh, on board. In conclusion, uh, there are a number of issues going forward, and these are more like, you know, to address some of the questions that we'll be discussing later on in the session, covering policy, planning, funding, governance, and knowledge and capacity areas, but I'll be happy to speak about it later on in the session. Thanks once again. It was a great pleasure, and uh, also, uh, muchas gracias uh, to, to all our colleagues from, uh, from Peru who are joining this session. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Boris, for sharing how scaling up uh, nature-based solutions is critical to achieving biodiversity, economic benefits, and social well-being. I think it's particularly interesting. Let's come back to that, what you mentioned about how to attract finance. In earlier session this morning, we said that maybe there is lack of finance. I don't believe there's a lack of finance on the global scale, but we have to attract the finance to invest in what we believe are the right investments for the future. Having said that, now over to uh, colleagues and team from Peru to share from a government context of implementing nature-based solutions in Peru. And we will have online uh, Amalia Moreno Vizcardo, Executive Director for Peruvian Government's Authority for Reconstruction with Changes. And here in Glasgow, I'm pleased to have Alberto Moro Ventura, Vice Minister of Agriculture, and also Alejandro Gutierrez, who is Technical Assi Assurance Director for UK for Arab. So please join me on stage, uh, you who are here in, 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 in Glasgow, and also Amalia uh, on, on the screen, and uh, share with us your uh, experience from Peru. And some of these parts will be in Spanish, but I think, Alejandro, you will also do some uh, uh, final up translation and summarize what has been discussed. So over to our colleagues from Peru. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tonby. Um, I'll do a very, very quick recap for all of us. Uh, the presentation will divide into three parts. Uh, we will start uh, with Amalia Moreno, which is online. Uh, she will be speaking in Spanish, then uh, the vice minister and then myself. Uh, I'll do the part in English. Uh, the slides will be in English, so you will be able to understand. In, at the end, uh, the video will, be, will have uh, subtitles for you to see afterwards. Um, it is a team effort. We'll try to do it quick, but I think the nature of what we want to do 
And what we are doing in Peru is a very, very integrated team effort between the Ministry of Agriculture, the Autoridad para la Reconstrucción, and uh, the UKDT, which is the technical advisor to the government. So without saying more, I will pass it to Amalia. Amalia, por favor. Gracias, Alejandro, por la presentación. Buenos días desde Perú a todos los ciudadanos y ciudadanas del mundo que eh, ahora eh, se citan, se dan cita en Glasgow para ver cuál es nuestro mejor eh, esfuerzo por el cambio climático. Quiero contarles que en el año 2017 ocurrió un desastre en el Perú. Un desastre que creo que sería injusto decir que fue un desastre natural porque poco o nada de responsabilidad podría tener la naturaleza cuando desde la humanidad no hacemos lo necesario para poder respetarla, cuidarla y sobre todo adaptarnos a ella dentro de la evolución de nuestra, eh, de, 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 de la propia humanidad. Cinco billones de dólares en pérdidas en este desastre. 1.8 Millones de personas fueron afectadas, perdieron sus casas, perdieron su modo de vida y eso obviamente nos afectó como país. Este fenómeno del niño también hizo reaccionar al Perú y tuvimos que tomar medidas. ¿Cuáles eran esas medidas que adoptó el Perú en su momento? Primero, crear la autoridad para la reconstrucción con cambios. Crear una autoridad que se encargue de reponer, de reparar toda la infraestructura dañada por el fenómeno del niño. Estas inundaciones habían causado grandes estragos en todos los sectores. Educación, salud, transportes, saneamiento, etc. Había que reponer lo que se había perjudicado, lo que se había destruido. Pero también fuimos conscientes de que haciendo una reconstrucción no estábamos mirando el bosque completo. Nosotros tenemos una frase que siempre identificamos eh, y siempre la repetimos. No hay reconstrucción sin prevención. Y es porque teníamos que analizar necesariamente las causas que generaron esas inundaciones. Y en ese análisis salió definitivamente como primer punto de, 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 de importancia, las, eh, eh, las soluciones integrales. Ver y recién mirar a la naturaleza y decir, ¿qué está pasando contigo? ¿Por qué, ¿Por qué es que suceden estos, estos cambios climáticos que traen tantas, tantas desgracias humanas? Y es ahí donde nosotros empezamos a mirar no solamente las soluciones integrales, sino que todo el proyecto de reconstrucción tenía que tener un enfoque sostenible, un enfoque resiliente y empezar a ver todo en su conjunto. Pero para hacer una solución integral de 17 ríos, no podíamos, no, no podíamos, eh, no podíamos todavía pensar en, en hacerlo solos y enfrentarnos a, esta, a, 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 a este proyecto solos y por eso es que se suscribe un convenio con uno de los países que tenía buenas prácticas internacionales y que salió seleccionado dentro de un proceso que es Reino Unido. Reino Unido además nos brinda asistencia técnica a través de las empresas Mace, Arup y Glit. Hemos hecho este esfuerzo conjunto, pueden regresar por favor, pues, hemos hecho este esfuerzo conjunto para eh, para poder juntos trabajar también en estas soluciones integrales. Entonces, vayamos ahora, y quisiera contarles, no sé si están en la presentación. Sí. Eh, no, anterior, por favor. Anterior. 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 Quiero contarles entonces en qué consiste este esfuerzo conjunto que, que estamos trabajando a través de un convenio eh, de, de, de gobierno a gobierno. Este convenio tiene como objetivo no solamente enfrentar y hacer estos megaproyectos, sino que también queremos un cambio en la sociedad, 
Queremos un cambio en nosotros, los funcionarios públicos, en los peruanos y peruanas que nos vemos afectados por estos, eh, por, por, por estos eh, 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 fenómenos eh, que se producen cada cierto tiempo. Y es así que este, este convenio no supone que venga un país a hacer las cosas por nosotros, sino más bien, o, algo, o alguna organización que haga las cosas por nosotros, sino que nosotros mismos aprendamos a hacer, a hacer estas, eh, esto, estos proyectos que van a traer definitivamente una mejora social, pero sobre todo le tiene que permitir a la, o devolverle a la naturaleza lo que es de la naturaleza. Tenemos la asistencia técnica a través de, de, de este convenio de gobierno a gobierno, tenemos procesos de contratación transparentes, porque también la transparencia y la falta de eh, y, y la perdón y la corrupción también atacan en los temas, los temas de fenómeno de los, los, los fenómenos naturales que nosotros tenemos que enfrentar. Y obviamente también se trata de la transferencia de conocimientos que es tan import importante para enfrentar estos retos. ¿Qué vamos a hacer dentro de este convenio? 74 colegios, 15 hospitales y eh, la solución integral de 17 ríos. Pero basta. Siguiente, por favor. Creo que hasta aquí nosotros podemos decir que esto es un, un, eh, un, un marco de lo que venimos haciendo, pero como nos dicen siempre nuestros ciudadanos y ciudadanas, basta del bla, bla, bla y tenemos que actuar. Actuar para nosotros significa que en este momento nosotros ya tenemos algunos resultados que mostrar y queremos decirle cómo desde la Autoridad de Reconstrucción con Cambios nos hemos adaptado. Nos adaptamos y tenemos un diseño, diseños resilientes dentro de toda la infraestructura que estamos haciendo en colegios y hospitales. Nos adaptamos a la naturaleza porque todos ellos tienen, por ejemplo, un, una, eh, un diseño eh, eh, que permite evitar las inundaciones. Mitigamos la huella de carbono porque además nos vamos a dedicar principalmente a la reforestación, a la revegetación y a la aforestación. Por supuesto que vamos a pensar en mitigar esta huella de carbono. Estamos generando soluciones basadas en naturaleza para evitar los estragos que supuestamente la naturaleza nos causa a nosotros. Estamos generando ya transferencia de conocimientos. Tenemos el ciclo de conocimiento completo. Nos dan el conocimiento. Nosotros como, eh, como país, como, como funcionarios, transmitimos conocimiento y a su vez todos los ciudadanos y ciudadanas de las localidades que van a ser beneficiadas nos dan su conocimiento respecto de, 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 cómo, de cómo evoluciona el clima y la naturaleza para cerrar el ciclo del conocimiento. Tenemos también, obviamente, y esto es un hito muy importante, el apoyo a las, a, a, en el desarrollo de las comunidades ese mano a mano con el que vamos a trabajar respetuosamente, respetuosamente de sus costumbres, respetuosamente de su conocimiento por vivir en esas zonas altoandinas y con ese conocimiento y con lo que nosotros vamos a llevar, queremos desarrollar esas comunidades para que puedan formar eh, comunidades de empleo local y para que puedan también tener un mejor, un, un mejor nivel de vida. Y obviamente queremos dejarle al Perú con todo este esfuerzo, gracias a que tenemos esta oportunidad eh, para poder eh, 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 generar este gran proyecto, tenemos que constituir ahora un legado para el Perú para poder seguir trabajando en eh, soluciones basadas en la naturaleza, en cómo nos reconstruirnos de manera respetuosa a la naturaleza y eso para nosotros será eh, un hito importante. Quiero decirles desde la Autoridad de Reconstrucción con Cambios que nosotros somos un soldado más para poder seguir luchando contra el cambio climático con respuestas, con, eh, eh, con acción inmediata, pero sobre todo también queremos eh, invitar a todas las empresas del mundo y obviamente también peruanas a participar en estos grandes proyectos que tenemos, sobre todo en los de reforestación. Queremos invitarlos a que confíen en nosotros porque estamos avanzando a paso firme en esta, en esta gran meta. El problema del cambio climático no es el problema del Perú, no es el problema de un país, es el problema para, de todos. Gracias. 
El proyecto de reconstrucción con cambios con el Ministerio de Desarrollo Agrario y Riego, desde el inicio trabajaron de manera articulada. Actualmente, en el gobierno del presidente Pedro Castillo y del Ministro de Desarrollo Agrario y Riego, Víctor Maita, venimos estrechando esta relación de cooperación. Y esta se da en el marco de la política general del gobierno para el periodo 2021-2026, que establece dentro de sus ejes principales lo siguiente. En el eje 7, precisa, gestión eficiente de riesgos y amenazas a los derechos de las personas y su entorno, la misma que, entre otros, establece lineamientos orientados al cuidado de nuestro entorno y la biodiversidad, así como medidas entre riesgos naturales y o antrópicos. El Ministerio de Desarrollo Agrario y Riego persigue dentro de estos lineamientos y políticas los siguientes objetivos. La implementación de medidas frente al inadecuado manejo de los recursos naturales en la producción agraria y ahí trabajamos en el recurso hídrico, en el suelo, en el bosque, en la fauna silvestre, enmarcándonos siempre dentro de la política nacional agraria de 2021 al 2030. Y además, hacemos una inclusión de medidas frente al incremento de riesgo de desastres naturales relacionados con indicadores y movimientos de masas. El MIDAGRI, el Ministerio de Desarrollo Agrario y Riego, con la ARS y a través del financiamiento de la Autoridad de Reconstrucción de Cambios, ha podido realizar estudios de preinversión como parte del portafolio de soluciones integrales para el control de inundaciones y movimientos de masa, lo que permite dar protección a la población de 15 cuencas de los ríos de las vertientes del Pacífico de eventos climáticos extremos como es el fenómeno del niño que se produce periódicamente en el Perú. Amalia habló de 17 ríos porque 15 aborda y trabaja el Ministerio de Desarrollo Agrario y Riego y dos que son el río Rima y el río Piura que trabajan los gobiernos regionales. Mayor injerencia del Midagri se ha logrado en todo este proceso de colaboración con reconstrucción con cambios en la implementación de infraestructura natural, atacando los temas de cobertura vegetal y conservación de suelos. El Midagri, en el mismo contexto de las soluciones integrales, ha formulado proyectos para reforestar y forestar más de 40.000 hectáreas en las cabeceras de cuencas de los 15 ríos, impactando positivamente en la erosión de los suelos. El Midagri y la Autoridad de Reconstrucción con Cambios complementan estos esfuerzos, suman sus recursos para así reducir los riesgos de desastres naturales por inundaciones y movimiento de tierra. Quiero terminar diciendo en esta parte de mi intervención que la participación del Midagri es clave por su experiencia y especialización en todo lo que es la construcción de las obras de riego y por supuesto a través del CERFOR, que es la autoridad competente forestal para trabajar todo el tema de forestación y reforestación y el CERFOR es una entidad adscrita al Ministerio. Este trabajo articulado es lo que nos está haciendo fuertes para enfrentar los desastres naturales y el cambio climático. Gracias. Gracias. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we can see that uh, the basis of the approach that um, the Peruvian government through the two agencies, a ministry and agency that you've uh, heard from, is uh, an integrated approach to watershed management on the rivers. We are talking about 17 rivers which account for uh, the size of England, more or less, if you add all of them together. Uh, and these 17 rivers have a very clear strategy, which I think is very aligned with what we heard before from uh, the, the colleagues from CIWI and the Stockholm Environmental Institute uh, about uh, managing uh, the uh, upstream with nature-based solutions to reduce peak flow, to reduce uh, mass movements, to increase biodiversity and so on using uh, diverse species that are locally sourced, and et cetera. Uh, then we have regulation and lamination in the middle of, of the river, of the watershed, and then control of flood 
management and then, of course, restoration throughout the whole uh, uh, river basin. That is the, the summary of the strategy in terms of the, 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 its integrated nature. And then I would like to go to the next slide where we very quickly describe what are the three elements of next yeah, uh, slide, what are the three elements of this uh, in, in more detail where the reforestation, afforestation, and, and renaturation of uh, gullies and the, and the, and the uh, slopes of the, of the watershed are fundamental. Uh, and uh, early warning systems that I think is a very important part uh, of the adaptation uh, strategy that the Peruvian government is putting forward for these very populated areas, as you're probably aware of. Next, next slide, please. Um, so in the next slide, you can see what within the um, re reforestation, what are the measures that we're putting forward about uh, terracing and structural mechanical practices for soil conservation, recovery of vegetation cover and capacity building and monitoring, which is providing sustainability in the long term to the interventions that are being put forward in the next, uh, as we speak and within the next five years. If we go to the next slide. Quickly, uh, I would like to discuss the benefits or the key features of this 17 river base. As you can see, they go from Ica in the very south of Peru to the top north of Tumbes. Uh, so it almost covers the whole length of the country on the coastal side. We are talking about 51,000 hectares, including the other two rivers, as the minister was saying. 56 millions of uh, seedlings are, are being planted in the next five years uh, with uh, the incorporation of high-tech nurseries and uh, acclimatization nurseries. And in terms of carbon footprint uh, sequestration, we are talking about in the region of 750,000 tons of CO2 equivalent per year uh, for the foreseeable future. And uh, the process of implementation is from January next year to December 2026. If we want to go to the next slide very quickly, we can talk about the benefits, which are uh, the ones that actually our colleagues have described before, but just in, in simple terms, using examples of rivers that we are working on in detail now, the Mala River, for example, the uh, afforestation and reforestation creates a reduction of 5% of the peak flow downstream, so it, it creates savings and... Uh, uh, in terms of the infrastructure that you need to, to do down, downstream. And of course, it reduced damages uh, in terms of erosion, flooding, uh, with uh, soil condition and terracing. And in the case of Mala only, we are we in La Cramarca, which is another river we're working on, 55,000 people will be, benefit, uh, will be benefiting from these uh, natural-based solutions that are being put forward. Of course, it does create another massive element of the benefits, which is about restoring natural habitats and improving biodiversity and air quality, and the one that we've described before, which is about CO2 capture. Uh, I would not like to finish the presentation without saying that there is a, the, I would say, state-of-the-art, the, the best uh, or, and, and most ambitious EWS early warning system being proposed and implemented. We've now signed that contract on behalf of the program government. It's a nationwide system using the most advanced technology, and that is part of the solution. Uh, it's not a nature-based solution, but it's an essential part of the solution for making lives safer for Peruvians. And I would like to finish, if we go to the next slide, uh, uh, the early warning system. I won't dwell into this in detail because we would like to have a bit of a conversation. And if we go to the last slide, which is number 16, I would like to say publicly that the government is very keen uh, and us as the technical advisors that uh, companies nas na nationally and internationally uh, register their interest for the implementation of the nature-based solutions, which is starting timely on the 17th of uh, November this year. So those that are interested, please uh, uh, subscribe your interest formally on the portal from the Reconstruction Agency in Peru so that we can then follow up with you in the near future. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, and thanks a lot for sharing the fundamental importance of trees, forest, reforestation that you also so eloquently described from your Peruvian experience and what you're doing in nature-based solutions, which also is very timely given the, the, the declaration yesterday of the Glasgow leaders on forest and land use. Now we are soon wrapping up this uh, session. Uh, I will maybe not call it a panel discussion, but I have a few follow-up questions to our panelists. So if I would be joined once again by uh, Dr. Lan Wang Erlandsson from Stockholm Resilience Center and Boris Erg from IUCN and our colleagues from Peru. And let me start directly with uh, Lan. Uh, what are some of the key benefits of and challenges to forest restoration as you see them? Over to you, Lan. 
Yes, so um, I think what, what we're really seeing in the, all this presentation is how important it is that the nature-based solutions provide multiple benefits and uh, beyond mitigation um, in terms of adaptation because climate change is already here and also for bi biodiversity crisis. We are here for the climate, but biodiversity crisis um, in terms of planetary boundaries, biosphere integrity is, is the most transgressed um, boundary, in fact. So it is um, um, ultimately very important and a key benefit that nature-based solutions are providing multiple benefits. In terms of challenges, uh, I think um, from a Earth system perspective, uh, I would really like to see it for sort of think about the drivers and system thinking that in terms of when we think about finance, when we think about funding, uh, the, the restoration also needs to take place somewhere. There isn't land for everything. And in terms to make a land available, uh, it's about diet change, it's about demand. So I was um, tempted to show also maps, but there, there were time constraints, so I didn't show that. But sort of how the deforestation is taking place in the tropics, but the demand of the consumption patterns, uh, the soybean export is going to Europe and North America. So it's not just about financing the nature-based solutions, but also addressing the whole system, including the uh, drivers and uh, the cross-scale dynamics of why these things play out. Uh, thanks a lot, Lan. And let me now turn to Boris. And uh, given your experience from the Western Balkans, uh, what do you see as the biggest challenges and opportunities for large-scale nature-based solution deployment at the global level? Boris. Certainly, thanks a lot. Uh, it's, uh, it's more than a, a valid, valid question. I mean, we can see nature-based solutions all over the place. Yeah? I can say that we are also just coming from, from our World Conservation Congress in Marseille in September, where we had a very, very strong statement uh, from from President Macron and other 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 global leaders uh, in 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 their intention really to scale up. So um, what we have to what we have to uh, enable really to to get there. Uh, I just hinted in my presentation, you know, just looking into some of the key pillars of what nature-based solutions are, be that local, national, regional, global level really have to look into how they are mainstreamed into, into policies. We did a, uh, uh, we are just to, about to publish a, a regional, we call it the comparative policy analysis, where we looked into sectoral policies, as primarily like, you know, uh, sectors like uh, water management and, and forestry, uh, uh, land use, agriculture, uh, and so on, just to see how nature-based solutions are being recognized and where are the major opportunities and gaps, yeah. So in terms of policy, we still we still see some gap uh, in in and, and when it comes to uh, mainstreaming mainstreaming nature-based solutions. So that's one big enabler, I would say. We are seeing nature-based solutions being integrated in key global processes. Conventions are recognizing. There are very strong statements and agreements being being made and so on. But it really has to kind of translate into international policy and even local policy. So for example, the pilot site that we are working in, in Serbia has now integrated nature-based solutions into their 10-year development strategy, which is very important for them, for their planning and financing, yeah? And then financing. So financing is a big challenge. Uh, we know that there are a lot of opportunities. I mean, so evidence shows that one US dollar, for example, investment in, invested in restoration can bring some estimates say five to 10, some 30 US dollars, but it's a it's high return on investment uh, at any rate, yeah? That there are there are opportunities for like in the six trillion US dollars for for business opportunities. If we invest two, we will get we, we can get back a, a a six, which is three to one uh, a return on investment. We are also seeing through the Bone Challenge Barometer that, for example, in Rwanda there 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 were twenty two thousand jobs uh, created through forest landscape restoration or El Salvador. 100,000, you know, and let alone carbon sequestration, co-benefits co and, and so on. So there are a lot of opportunities. So this kind of, you know, a wealth of evidence uh, is growing. Yet, I would say that in, in order to turn this, uh, turn this opportunity into, into, into action, uh, that we still have to make work on making a clear case, business case for nature-based solutions. So there are, there are a number of reports and, and assessments but we, we have to really to strengthen and make sure that it's fully contextualized, that it's tailored, 
and it really speaks to what uh, what what really it is. And then, of course, to integrate nature-based solutions into into planning processes. So retrofitting is, a, is 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 not an option. I mean, you know, kind of as we heard, and it's a very nice quote that that's speaking about economy on Monday and then uh, ecology on Tuesday and restoration on Wednesday is not really an option. So really, have to be taken upfront. The nature-based solutions they have to be an integral integral part of uh, of planning processes. When I when I say nature-based solutions, also to make it clear, and then our, 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 our standard uh, stresses is uh, very, very clearly and strongly. So we do not speak about restoration only. So we don't want to get reach that point when we have to restore. So it's actually to conserve what we have at hand to better manage in a more integrated way and then restore when, when restoration needs to take place. So all those kind of three facets of nature-based solutions, they have to be they have to be fully integrated. And then finally, a capacity of knowledge. So knowledge is being, is, is being built uh, as we speak. And what IUCN tries also to do is to create a regional knowledge and capacity development hubs. So to make sure that at all levels, basically, that there is enough knowledge, that there is enough capacity uh, to uptake uh, nature-based solutions. So that's just a kind of, you know, uh, highlighting few challenges and opportunities as we see them. Thank, thanks a lot, Boris. And let me once again turn to our colleagues from Peru, uh, Amalia Moreno Vizcardo, Vice Minister Jorge, Alberto Muro Ventura, and Alejandro Gutierrez here in Glasgow. And my question to you are, what do you see as the main role of governments in promoting the implementation of nature-based solutions? So, over to you. Okay. Um, bueno, para, para nosotros, eh, eh, ya en la implementación de este proyecto, ha sido muy importante la participación y hacer sentir no solamente a las comunidades, sino a las autoridades locales que forman parte de este megaproyecto. Una lección aprendida es que nosotros no podemos generar estos, estos proyectos de importancia, sean soluciones integrales, sean colegios, sean hospitales, de espaldas a los directamente beneficiados. Eh, y eso es eh, eh, algo que venimos implementando eh, en nuestro proyecto, en la Autoridad de Reconstrucción con Cambios, para que pueda eh, eh, materializarse. Y eso también nos ha permitido que a lo largo de este proyecto, que constituye, por ejemplo, la reforestación de 51 hectáreas, ¿no? que se van a intervenir, ¿no? donde también se generarán más de 56 millones de plántulas, donde generaremos viveros de alta tecnología y viveros de aclimatación, Nuestro, este, nuestros beneficiarios, los ciudadanos y ciudadanas directamente vinculados a estos proyectos están eh, no solamente orgullosos, sino con mucha expectativa de cómo se va a realizar y cómo ellos van a intervenir con nosotros. Hacen suyo este gran proyecto y creo que esa comunicación continua, eh, sin, eh, vamos a decir, sin barreras eh, que nosotros tenemos con, con, con ellos, nos ha permitido eh, generar eh, resultados relativamente rápidos, porque nosotros hemos empezado este proyecto a través del convenio de gobierno, gobierno aproximadamente hace año, un año, cuatro meses aproximadamente, y podemos decir que ahora ya tenemos, eh, 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 digamos, resultados en camino y en, específicamente en lo que significa la reforestación, nuestra línea de tiempo, es empezar, este, o, ojalá que eh, ya con contrato suscrito el primer trimestre del año 2022 y ese trabajo tiene que hacerse hasta el año 2026. Si nosotros tenemos la oportunidad de compartir con ustedes nuevamente en el siguiente en la siguiente COP, espero que nosotros le demos ya los, eh, los avances que tenemos respecto de la reforestación y respecto de cómo hemos articulado y cómo hemos trabajado en conjunto con estas, con estas comunidades. Tenemos altas expectativas nosotros desde el gobierno para que a través de este gran proyecto podamos también eh, eh, ganarnos la confianza y sobre todo eh, poder eh, potencializar las capacidades de las comunidades que van a ser directamente eh, eh, beneficiadas con la reforestación en la parte alta de las cuencas donde vamos a intervenir. Es un, un reto, es un reto grande, pero también sabemos que no solamente va a tener un enfoque sostenible desde, el, eh, de, de, desde, desde la mirada eh, ambiental, 
sino también va a tener un enfoque social, ¿no? un, este, una sostenibilidad social en el tiempo y eso es lo que nosotros eh, queremos lograr con este, con este gran proyecto de la reconstrucción. Nuevamente quiero terminar con esta frase que siempre eh, señalamos eh, desde, nuestras, eh, desde nuestra institución que queremos devolverle a la naturaleza lo que es de la naturaleza y para eso necesitamos no solamente nuestra participación sino la participación de todas las comunidades y autoridades de las regiones beneficiadas. Uh, muchas gracias. And over to colleagues here in uh, Glasgow, Vice Minister and Alejandro. El rol de los gobiernos es liderar la formulación, el desarrollo y la operación y mantenimiento de las obras que se realizan con la asesoría de la autoridad con reconstrucción con cambios. Creo que este rol de liderazgo es clave para luego pasar da la experiencia a normar para que así se institucionalice todos los diferentes procedimientos, instrumentos, mecanismos que se han formulado para evitar estos riesgos y así nos adaptemos al cambio que está produciendo el cambio climático. Y además un rol importante de los gobiernos a multinivel, porque tenemos que hablar a nivel local, a nivel regional, a nivel nacional, en el caso del Perú, es lograr que la población tome conocimiento, se involucre en la implementación, se involucre en la sostenibilidad, el cuidado de aquellas obras y aquellas plantaciones que se han hecho en las partes altas, como la reforestación o la forestación, que nos permita que todo lo que hemos implementado se mantenga en el tiempo y así evite nuevos desastres naturales. Esos roles me parecen determinantes en las diferentes entidades del Estado. Hello. So I'll make a summary in English of what Amalia and the minister have said. I think Amalia focused on two, three points about uh, doing this with communities. Uh, and the fact that it is done with communities connects with what the minister was saying is to provide long-term sustainability because they have ownership and stewardship of those interventions. Um, I think that was the main focus of Amalia. Uh, also, she mentioned that uh, the Re uh, Autoridad Reconstrucción con Cambios has been able to uh, actually do this in a very quick fashion. In the last uh, 18 months, we've gone from design to delivery now, and the 17th of December, sorry, of November, we'll open up the process of um, request for bids for the large uh, implementation that we've described on the screen. Uh, and the minister focused on uh, the role of government as leading on the, on the drafting and implementation of the interventions so that they are done uh, in, a, in, a, in the appropriate manner as we were showing before. But most importantly, he was saying that from these projects, which is quite large in terms of their scope and remit, uh, we should learn to produce new regulation uh, in Peru so that this does not become the exception, but the rule as a policy element. Uh, and he also mentioned the issue of communities, both at local, regional and national level, uh, in order to provide long-term sustainability, working with those communities is fundamental. Um, uh, Amalia closed with a very, I mean, I would say, uh, compelling remark about giving back to nature what belongs to nature. And I think that's one important element of the design uh, principles that are being implemented uh, through this program. I would leave it there because I think it's a very good manner to finish on, on the response. Thanks a lot and thanks a lot to all panelists and presenters today. Wherever you have shared with us the opportunities provided by nature-based solutions in forest uh, ecosystems, all of us know that the climate crisis is a water crisis. Global, water, global warming sorry, is hitting hard the water cycle and also particularly in, the, in low income countries and recognizing the importance of the forest water nexus is an important step I believe in building water management into institutional processes and valuing forests for water. There are definitely great opportunities in nature's ability to sequester carbon and also to store carbon and also building resilience to a changing climate and by that also contributing to that we are to achieve the sustainable development goals. So my final line is 
Without forests, there are no healthy water cycles. So with that, thanks here from Glasgow, and see you at next uh, session, which I think will start in half an hour. So bye for now. <laughs>